I greet you in Lord's holy name. We'll continue our study from the book of Jeremiah. And uh, in these days, the way in which we hear more and more news about uh, the attack of Corona virus in many, many villages and towns and cities and in every state, it's very disturbing. I'm sure that you're following the news. And every day we hear that uh, some of our brothers and sisters are entering into God's glory. Anyway, with a heavy heart, uh, uh, we have to continue to pray for God's protection and God's grace. And also we have to be careful in our own uh, personal disciplines. May the Lord help each one of us to be uh, careful about it. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, we could uh, meet together regularly for this uh, Bible study. And today I request uh, dear Shiny from West Godavari, District Andhra Pradesh, to lead us in prayer. Shiny. Shani, for that meaningful prayer. Last two days, we looked at the book of Jeremiah, starting from the historical context of Jeremiah. And along with that, we looked at the person, Jeremiah. That's one thought. It is coming out forcefully in this book. Every day, we look at from different perspectives about this person, Jeremiah. And we looked at uh, the call and commission which God has given to Jeremiah as a young man, he received it. Then we talked about Jeremiah's ministry. In the first day itself, we saw two of his messages. And there we saw the people of God who were unfaithful to the Lord God. Jeremiah was constantly giving these messages, these sermons to the people of God to come back, to repent, so that God will not punish them. So the message was uh, uh, constantly coming. If you will rep repent, God will not punish you. Otherwise, you have to face the consequences. That message was going. Yesterday, we saw another five sermons. So, so far, we have looked at seven sermons of Jeremiah. Yesterday, also, we saw that... Uh, Jeremiah was challenging God's people to come back to God. And then he's talking about God's uh, anger upon them. If you're not going to come, God will be very angry with you. That message was going on in these sermons. Along with that, we could uh, look at uh, Jeremiah's life in these three aspects. He was the one who is receiving God's word and passing on to other people. At the same time, he could uh, enact the message. He was in his life, he was enacting the messages. That's what we saw yesterday. Along with that, even his own life itself has become a message. Don't get married. It is a very unusual uh, request from God in the Old Testament, even in New Testament. It's a calling. That's what we talked yesterday. Everybody should get married. That is God's will. 
And if God wants you to be single, then it should be a specific calling for that. And in Jeremiah's time, we know, we know that God wanted him to be uh, single so that he can minister to uh, people. And also in that context, he should not have a wife or children, things like that. So that's the way we looked at yesterday. That's a challenge. So it is not that we need to compare that same message for ourselves. Rather, we need to understand what are the things I have to leave for the sake of God's kingdom. That is very important. That's what yesterday we saw that. Along with that, we looked at the prayer life of Jeremiah. The one who cried out, the one who was pleading. And also, we looked at uh, the faith. If you have faith in men, then your uh, life will be finished. You cannot uh, survive. That's what we saw yesterday evening when you are closing. But uh, chapter 17, verse 7, it says, when we have faith in God and only in God, our life will be very fruitful and we will be a blessing to others. So both on our faith and on prayer, Jeremiah had a message yesterday. Today, we are going to continue and we are going to look at the other five sermons. Totally, there are 12 sermons of Jeremiah. He preached in different places in different times. In the end, we are going to see that uh, 23 long years, he was preaching these 12 sermons. So in that way, I want you to uh, imagine, I want you to uh, go into the text. 23 long years, Jeremiah was preaching in different places. And now we are studying that in chapter 2 to 25. We read that. So this five uh, sermons also can be uh, highlighted in this way. First one, it's more of uh, the pottery that we are going to look at. Three chapters, they go together with that message. And then uh, from 21 onwards, clearly God is uh, uh, giving message to the kings and also to the leaders, priests. And uh, third one, it's more of a false prophets, a separate message God is giving them uh, what he wanted to communicate to them. Then uh, a vision that's in 24 and 25, last chapter, we can see that uh, there is a, a shift in the uh, history. There is a turning point in the history of Jerusalem and to the people of Israel. That's what we are going to look at. Today, our approach is going to be a little different. Yesterday, we saw each uh, message and then we looked at paragraph wise. And I'm sure that when you're going to reread and then read it, and then when you're going to study it, then that paragraphs will help you to understand the message. But today's approach, we are going to look at these uh, five sermons from these headings. First, we are going to look at on God's perspective. Where is God of Israel? What are his attributes? What he says that we are going to look at in these sermons. Second one, like right from the beginning, we look at about God. And also, secondly, we look at the person, the man, the prophet, Jeremiah. We all need to identify with Jeremiah. His actions and also his reactions. Today we are going to spend a little time on his reactions. It's mixed. Be ready for that. It's a mixed feeling or mixed reaction of Jeremiah. He's a human being. He's not an angel. He's uh, uh, exactly like us with, uh, uh, with all his limitations. He was there ministering. So his reactions also we need to be considering seriously. Third one, the people of God. That's what we are talking now. The message was coming to the people of God, not to the Gentiles. That we are going to look at later. This message is clearly for Christians. That's the way we have to speak. 
they have the name of god in their life but they are not obeying him the warnings they receive that we are going to look at and how they respond that also we need to look at today fourthly i want to add one more dimension that is the leaders that's important as we look at this passage definitely we need to make note of it because this passage talks about some of the leaders political leaders and religious leaders both are there political leaders in terms of kings they are asking Jer jeremiah and jeremiah is talking to the kings and uh, priests they are the religious leaders and even the high priest was beaten jeremiah that's what we are going to look at so their attitude and their arrogance that we can look at here itself i wanted to tell you because we may not have enough time to spend on leaders <coughs> my dear brothers and sisters don't think that i am not a leader and this is only for kings and uh, the political leaders <coughs> and religious leaders don't think like that i know that most of you are young people <coughs> and here i want to tell you that all of us are leaders in one way or other we may not have any position as such so don't simply say that this uh, uh, leaders column is not for me the one way or other you are leading others and you are uh, involving in leadership positions you know church in your ministries even taking care of one small cell group and everywhere you are a leader number one number two i am constantly telling you if the lord's coming is going to be delayed 10 years later 20 years later you are all going to be the leaders of the church and missions and i wish and pray these bible studies should really help you to have a right right attitude humility submissiveness servant heart as leaders so consider this message as a warning so that you can keep yourself in the days to come to be a good servant leader today we are going to read the first passage that's a very powerful uh, passage in terms of god is speaking to his people with a dramatic way i'm sure that you might have heard uh, sermons from jeremiah 18 so far if you haven't studied this passage if you haven't prepared any bible study um, message or if you haven't done any personal study please make note of it today we are not going to give full justice to this text but let's hear god's word i am so happy that dear christina from uh, calcutta she is reading the passage for us yes christina am i audible uncle yes sir christina praise the lord uh, jeremiah chapter 18 verse 1 to 11 this is the word that came to jeremiah from the lord go down to the potter's house and there i will give you my message so i went down to the potter's house and i saw him working at the wheel but the pot he was shaping from the clay was married in his hands so the potter formed it into another pot shaping it as seemed best to him then the word of the lord came to me he said can i not do with can i not do with you israel as this potter does declares the lord like clay in the hand of the potter so are you in my hand israel if at any time i announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted torn down and destroyed and if that nation i want repents of its evil then i will relent and not inflict on it the disaster i have planned and if at another time i announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me 
then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now, therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. Here end the reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for that wonderful reading. I really appreciate that. As I said, we are going to concentrate uh, God of Israel. Here it comes out very powerfully. Let me start with this thought. Our God is a God of second chances. When you look at this picture, uh, as we read here, when the potter is working and if it is not coming properly and then God, he prepares. And uh, this is uh, a simple thought, but I want you to uh, consider very seriously. My dear brothers and sisters, God, our God is a God of second chances. If you believe that, you need to be excited about it. There are many, many young people when uh, they have love failure or when they don't get good marks or when they fail in the subjects or when marriage proposal is dropped, immediately they come to a conclusion that God is not uh, there and they started blaming God. And many times we don't consider God is a God of second chances. So my dear brothers and sisters, first and foremost, keep that on. God is not going to throw us. God will give chances for us. So any one of you who are here in this Bible study thinking that uh, you're gone and how God is going to handle you, don't worry. It is a clear-cut message that God gives second chances. Along with that, I wanted to tell you in the third point, the people of God, it's mentioned in six. That's another important point I wanted to share with you. In verse 6, we see that uh, he said, can I not do with you, Israel, at this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in, the, in my hand, Israel. So this is not usually God is talking. This you is plural. Israel the people of God. If so, God of second chances is not only for individuals, it's for the family, it's for uh, the movement, it's for the church. As a group of people, as Israel, when we are failing to God, God gives second chances. If so, you cannot think of this person, this movement, this church, this family has gone and God cannot do anything with them. You cannot say that because our God is a God of second chances. Look at verse 8 where we see that God is gracious. That's what I'm talking in these day, uh, three days. In Old Testament times, normally we think that God is uh, a God who punishes. God wanted to take uh, very ang with anger. He wanted to do things for his people. But here we see that God is gracious. And if that nation I want repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. God has kept a disaster on that nation, on these people and on that ministry. But when they repent, God says, I will change as he did for Nineveh when Jonah preached. So that is a very clear-cut message. We can see that. But if you are not going to change, in verse 9, it says, I will punish you. And if another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to build and plant it, and if does evil in my sight and does not obey me, and definitely I will uh, punish them and destroy them. That's what God says. 
let's look at uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 11. I told you that I'm not uh, taking by passage by passage. The three messages I'm putting together. And when you look at on God, chapter 19, verse 11, we read about it. I read from 10. Then break the jar while those who go with you are watching and say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation and this city just as his potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. So this is second uh, story. That is in 19th chapter, we read about it. That we see that uh, God is telling you take a part, earthen part, along with leaders, you go and talk to the elders and talk to them and you break it. Then you say that as it was broken, as it was broken, you remember that I will also break the nation like that. That's a message God wanted to communicate. So God will destroy if you're not going to obey him. That's the way we see that. Now, let us uh, uh, take time to look at uh, Jeremiah's life. Before that, I have to tell you, even in New Testament, the jar uh, of clay is mentioned. Jar of clay, we can put it and it will break. And uh, Paul has brought out in a very beautiful way. When we studied the Second Corinthians a few months back, we were excited to study this verse. But, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. What does it mean? God gives a surpassing power. And uh, it is from God. It's not from us. But outside, it is a jar of clay. That's the way Paul beautifully brings out a metaphor saying that uh, it is a clay outside. Inside, God's power is there. And here, it's a different story, but it is about the vessel, talking about, even in Acts 9, chapter, verse 15 and 16, we read about it. When God called Ananias to go and heal Saul, he said, in 15, Acts 9, 15, we read that God said, I have chosen this vessel for me, this man, Saul, is a chosen vessel of me. So individually, we can very well easily connect this message as a, a vessel in God's hand. God keeps the power within us that we can easily find out. But this uh, uh, J Jeremiah 18 chapter talks about the community, God's people together. Keep, it, keep that in mind. And uh, let, let's look at Jeremiah's life. As he was passed on this message, they started attacking him. The people and the leaders started attacking Jeremiah. I'll read verse 18 for you. They said, come, let us make plans against Jeremiah. For the teaching of the law by the priest will not cease, nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. So come. Let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anyone, anything he says. Look at that. He, they talk about the teachers of law is there and priests were there and uh, the prophets there are there. So don't hear anything this man Jeremiah says. Then they are going to kill him with, not with sword, with words. That's what it says. Let us attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. My dear brothers and sisters, yesterday we saw that they wanted to kill him. That's what God revealed to Jeremiah. Physically also people were killing, but here the leaders of Israel wanted to attack him or uh, they wanted to confront Jeremiah with their own words. I know that all of us have such experiences. Maybe as you know in the ministry, you can see that people come and attack us with their words. They say 
uh, either very negatively about us saying that uh, what we are doing is just nothing and uh, they discourage us. Otherwise, they will come and say that I will uh, punish you or I will attack you if you are going to continue with that. Anything can happen. But it, these are all from tongue, they have done it. Then in 20th chapter, I have some more points to share with you. Just before that, let me tell you briefly about the leaders. 19th chapter verse 1 talks about it. This is what the Lord says, go and uh, buy a clay jar from a potter. Take along with some of the elders of the people and of the priest and go to the valley of ben Hinnom near the entrance of the Beshagar gate. Then you proclaim to the leaders and to the people. So it's clearly the message for the leaders, the political leaders. And chapter 20 talks about the spiritual leader the high priest. Let me read chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. When the priest Beshar, son of Imer, the official in charge of the temple of the Lord, he is a priest in charge for the temple, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. He had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks of upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. Here, the high priest is not scolding him with words. Here, literally, physically, they attacked him. So physically also, you will be attack, attacked and uh, emotionally, psychologically, and uh, in, any way, in many, many ways, we can be attacked. And especially when people shout at us, we don't like to hear that. That really uh, disturbs us. And that's what it has happened in the previous chapter. And here we see that... Uh, they, he literally attacked him. Let's go forward. And uh, in chapter 20, verse 8 and 9, I have to read for you. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. As this high priest was beating me, as people are telling, whenever I go and preach God's word, I get insult only and I get reproach. People are scolding me. People are cursing me. Verse 9. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I cannot. Very interesting. Look at verse 9. He says, I don't want to preach. I don't want to tell uh, others about God's word because every, every time I'm getting insult. Now, the problem is, if I keep God's word within me without sharing with others, I have a big problem. That is something like a fire in my bone. And I cannot uh, handle it. I cannot keep it within me. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm sure that is our experience. There were times we are supposed to share God's word, maybe in a group or in an individual way. But when I say that I'm not going to share, it disturbs me a lot. It is inside something like a fire in my bone. That's the way we need to consider our preaching and teaching ministries. Keep that in mind, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 8 and 9. In the context of his persecution, Jeremiah has to preach God's word, otherwise he'll be in trouble. Inside uh, his heart, he cannot keep his word. Then he uh, praising God and he has a great confidence in God. Let, let's look at uh, verse 11 onwards. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. It's a powerful uh, uh, metaphor. God is with me and uh, he's a mighty warrior. Why I should be afraid of them? Just a few verses before, he was telling that I don't want to speak because I'm getting insult. And I'm getting all sorts of uh, uh, pressures. But later, he says that uh, I cannot keep it with me because it is really disturbing me and uh, I have to speak. Here he says, God is a mighty warrior. 
and look at uh, verse 13, even 12 or so. Lord Almighty, you examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind. Let me see your vengeance on them. For to you, I have committed my cause. Those people are very much against your word. But I love your word and I respect your word. I honor your word. And uh, you examine the righteous people. That's what he says. Verse 13, sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Very powerful uh, chorus or song. It is not new. Right in Exodus 15 chapter, we read that. When they came out from Egypt, Moses sang a song. And then the first paragraph, first stanza is like that. Sing to the Lord. Give praises to the Lord. God has delivered us. So that is a, a, a powerful song or chorus for the people of God. Here also, Jeremiah is singing with midst of his feeling. But that's not the end. The next passage talks about a different perspective. That's what I wanted to tell you. On Monday, I told you, Jeremiah was not covering up his feelings. He was not saying that, praise the Lord, everything is fine with me. And then he's not saying that uh, a mighty warrior is with me, so I don't have any problem. Here, we read, as Job said, cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, a child is born to you as son. It's a very painful passage. I couldn't digest it. How it's possible a person like Jeremiah can say like that? Job, before God, he was a saint. God told to even to Satan, look at my servant Job. He was, to the core, he was faithful. But even Job, in the beginning, he said the same thing like this. Cursed is a man who brought my father the news who had made him very glad saying, a child is born to you, a son. Here, Jeremiah is saying, he is not quoting others. He is telling about his own lament. My brothers and sisters, here in this evening, I'm not saying that we all have to say this way. My point here is, it is possible with all our rejoices, there may be some times like Jeremiah, like Elijah, and like Moses, we may also be in a trouble to say like, Lord, why I'm here? It's better for me to die. Why I was born? To that level, we may lament. That's what exactly happened. So I'm highlighting this point under the life of Jeremiah. That's what I told you. He's not an angel. He's an ordinary human being like you and me. He had very powerful ministries. That's what we are going to look at. But at the same time, he had his own challenge in one point of time that he couldn't uh, face it. How do we face challenges like this? We may not say like Jeremiah, but sometimes when we look at many uh, problems in our personal life, we may be wondering, and I like this song, when upon life's pillows you are tempest toast, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I'm sure that all of you know this song, uh, you know this hymn. It is very powerful. Jeremiah had a tough time. And as this uh, songwriter has mentioned, uh, when everything is gone, nothing is there. I'm completely discouraged. But let me sit down and count the blessings. My dear friends, uh, this is a very powerful hymn. I wanted to tell you that uh, this is a message for all age groups it's needed. Uh, if you are quite young, it's possible that you are not in a position to handle some of the problems and challenges you face in life from people and from leaders and from family and from the society. 
and uh, sometimes uh, uh, maybe our own personal problems, failures in life, and uh, we are not in a position to uh, uh, process this failure. And uh, family people, it's very much possible. There may be some times it's possible. But let me give you a very peculiar one example from my life. When we are retired from uh, active ministry of UESI staff team, we were in a place called Kotagiri. And uh, there were some uh, programs where uh, people gave a farewell to us. One of the farewells was conducted by the local churches, a group of people, a remnant group of people in the uh, fellowship in the churches. Uh, it was organized by one Reverend Philip Malley, a senior pastor in Kotagiri. So they uh, gave a farewell because you are leaving from Kotagiri. And uh, as churches, we miss your ministry. Like that, they wanted to give. And they talked about uh, our ministry there. Then they sang this song for us. When you are retiring from ministry, this song came to me afresh. I thought it's only young people should think of having many problems. So they need to think of God's blessings. I Many, many times I sang this song. But now, as a retired person, I want to keep this song. Not everything is lost. I need to consider what are the blessings the Lord has given me. So my dear brothers and sisters, I know that we are here in this Bible study fellowship from different walks of life, from different age groups. So like Jeremiah, Jeremiah was not a retired person. I consider that he was around the 40s. That's the way I look at it because I'm, a little later I'm going to tell you. When he was speaking like that, he was not an old man like me. In his 40s, he said like that. Right. But if any age group, you may be quite young or you are a, a bit uh, adult age and then you are into the family life and you are nearing to retirement or you are in the middle age or you are retired. Any age group, when you're facing challenges in life, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And you will know what a great God whom we worship. 21 onwards, we see that there's a shift. Here, the king has invited the king Zedekiah, sent him Bashu, the one we read about him in the previous chapter, the one who beaten uh, Jeremiah. Now the king is sending this high priest along with one more priest. Go and inquire now of the Lord for us because Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is attacking us. That's a message uh, coming from the king. And clearly we could see that God's judgment is uh, pronounced by Jeremiah. He could say without any hesitant, he says, go and tell the king. Straight away he says, this is a message God is giving. Not only that, in chapter 22, we read that in first verse, this is what the Lord says, go down to the palace of King Judah and proclaim this message there. Hear the word of the Lord to you, King of Judah, you who sit on the David's throne, you, your officials, and your people who come through these gates. So I look at chapter 21. He is in his home, something like a comfort zone. And the king is sending two people to find out the message from Jeremiah. That's a different story. He can boldly say message to the king. But in chapter 22, that's a different context. God says, don't sit here and talk. You go and go to the palace and straight away you speak. My brothers and sisters, that's what I'm saying. The boldness of uh, Jeremiah was amazing. God told him and he went forward. And also we could uh, look at uh, the people. Two verses I want to read for you. 
there are many many messages here coming out i i really wish that you will take time to read these passages one by one and study for yourself you can get more messages clearly coming out chapter 21 verse 8 look at this furthermore tell the people this is what the lord says see i am setting before you the way of life and the way of death you have to choose from now onwards we are going to talk little different message coming from god i am keeping a choice for you that's what he says that we are going to look at what is a choice here it says very clearly it's a way of life and way of death in next passage also we are going to read about it and along with that 22 verse 3 look at this verse this is what the lord says do what is just and right rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed do not wrong or violence to the foreigner the fatherless or the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place still god gives opportunity to the leaders and he says you repent and not only uh, worship me but keep all these things this is almost like amos message amos is the one who was talking about social justice what all the things you have to do and clearly jeremy also saying the same thing to the people and to the leaders you repent and do what is just and right so my dear brothers and sisters in the churches and in the organizations in our families we need to take this message seriously it is not only that our uh, relationship with god is good i am giving very good offering and i am going to the worship regularly all sorts of things we can say but what about verse 3 of 22 am i doing right and just am i rescuing the hand of the oppressor from who is uh, robbed do not do wrong or violence to the foreigners that means uh, the other people who are away from us and also it says to the fatherless and to the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place when we studied book of james in the first chapter last verse says like that the true religion is taking care of our uh, orphan and widows be concerned about them sometimes we think that religion or uh, our spirituality is only in our meditations and uh, prayer and meditation it's more than that our life should reflect the righteousness of god in us i can go on but definitely uh, make note of this verse am i reflecting god's righteousness in my life that's what we have to look at and uh, 23rd chapter verses 9 to 40 we <coughs> read about the false prophets the other passage talks about the, the priest and kings and the leaders in the book of jeremia we read about it that's what i told in the beginning we need to consider seriously the <coughs> people who are in leadership position both in the political arena and also in the religious uh, uh, setup and they were unfaithful and here it is about the leading false prophets there are many things you have to take time to study let me highlight some of the points when you consider god verse 29 is an important verse for me verse 29 is not my word like fire declares the lord and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces i really love this uh, metaphor for god's word somebody has said there are almost 25 metaphors or boost to describe god's word we you know in psalm 119 the word of god is a lamp it's a light and uh, in james first chapter we read that uh, james is telling that god's word is a mirror and here look at this two metaphors it's not my word like fire declares the lord and like a hammer that breaks 
the rock in pieces. My dear brothers and sisters, we have God's word. It is not a simply comforting words and it's not a correcting words. It can break like a hammer. That's an experience of us. When we go to the uh, evangelistic meetings, that is our strong conviction. When I preach, even a hard heart can break because of two things. One is it's because of the conviction gives, given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave conviction that I'm a sinner. Secondly, God's word. God's word is a hammer. It can break the heart of an uh, uh, unbeliever. It can break the heart of a believer. I am uh, somehow stuck up with sin and I am stuck up with uh, a depression. I am stuck up with some of the uh, bad habits. Then God's word comes. It can break like a hammer. It can make a fire in me. So beautifully, when you look at God, we cannot God, we cannot separate God and his word. Secondly, about Jeremiah, in this context, he was a true prophet. Everywhere, false prophets. But there is a prophet who was faithful. My dear brothers and sisters, that's a condition of our time also. As we read in the last letter by Paul, in the last chapter, that is 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read there are times people will be longing to hear what they want to hear. They want to have preachers who can come and preach comfort, comfort. They can talk about love, love, love. Every time they want to hear such messages only. They don't want to hear prophets like Jeremiah coming and preaching. So that was a time where Paul is talking in his last letter. Even today, we see such people around. In churches, they want to hear only uh, comfortable messages. These false prophets, in the last passage, we read that uh, they were talking about uh, God's concern, God's concern. But uh, uh, we know that uh, it, is, it is not true. It is false. They use God's name. When you look at uh, verse 33 onwards, at least five times, this phrase is coming. The concern of God. And, uh, but it is not a true concern of God. So even the false prophets use God's word. Even false prophets will be uh, using uh, something very uh, nice words. But we need to be careful. My dear brothers and sisters, now let me talk about uh, the people around. They have to choose whether to take the true prophet Jeremiah or the false prophets. And remember, there were people who are faithful. That's what I wanted to communicate. Here in this chapter, it's not mentioned. I look at a couple. They helped their son. His name is Daniel. And I can think of other three boys, Daniel's friends. I can think of uh, the parents of those four people. We don't know anything about them. They do, we don't know anything. But they're all in this category. When Jeremiah was preaching, this uh, very spiritual, sincere people were there. Ezekiel, we are going to read little later about Ezekiel. Ezekiel's parents were there. These are the known people. They're all young people there. And their parents were very dedicated, very sincere. How do we know that? In Daniel chapter 8, chapter 1, verse 8, we read that. How come these young people can say that we are not going to eat this food? We don't want to corrupt our bodies with this food. We, we are going to take a stand. How come it came? Not all of a sudden, when they're going towards Babylon, they were not converted. They were not changed by that values. I'm sure they were brought up in that way. The values were there. My dear brothers and sisters, one way we know that Jeremiah's ministry was a failure. Jeremiah's ministry was not very successful that many people uh, accepted his message. They all went to the false prophets. But we know there was a remnant group like these parents who helped the family to be a faithful one. 
they helped the children to obey the Lord. Let's go forward. We have some more message in these two chapters before we close. In chapter 24, it's a small chapter. We see that uh, it's mentioned about the historical time. Zoya so, uh, came. That is in 19, uh, sorry, um, 597 BC. 597 BC, it has happened. Second time, Nebuchadnezzar came and he took this king and uh, the officials and skilled people, artisans, and uh, taken from them. First time he came and took exactly like that. Good people, highly talented people have gone. That was in six knots five. And here God gave a vision, dream, that is good and bad fig fruits. What do you see? I see two uh, baskets full of good food, uh, good fruits, and other side, bad fruits. Look at this. Here, God says, um, verse 8 onwards, but like the bad figs, which are so bad that they cannot be eaten, says the Lord, so I will deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and survivors from Jerusalem, whether they remain in this land or live in Egypt. My brothers and sisters, the previous passage talks about good fruits or people like Daniel, Ezekiel, and others who are gone. By obeying Jeremiah's voice, you go to Babylon so that you will escape. So they went to Babylon. They are the good fig fruit. And those who wanted to stay back or wanted to get the support of Egypt, they're all worst people. They are the very bad fruits. So here, people had a wrong understanding of God's punishment. Wrong understanding of God's punishment. The leaders who are proposing that we will stay back here in Jerusalem and here in Israel, Babylon will not come because God's presence is here and uh, we will be safe. They are the false prophets who are speaking loudly to the king and others. But there was a Jeremiah who was shouting and along with uh, Sephaniah and along with Habakkuk, he was crying out and saying that no, no, God will punish uh, God's people through Babylon. And Jeremiah said very clearly, you go, better you go so that God can bless you. That's what we see in these two chapters. My dear brothers and sisters, even today, uh, how do we handle God's punishment? It's very uh, difficult to understand this point. The Babylon captivity was God's way of punishing the rebels and purifying the godly remnant of the nation. So through Jeremiah, God said, you better go and be safe. Your life is safe. Later, I will bring you back. 70 years later, I will bring you back. Now, if you stay back here, Babylonians will come and attack you and your king will die and you also will die. That message was very clearly communicated to people uh, through Jeremiah. Look at this uh, 23 years is mentioned here in chapter 25. Let me read and finish. Uh, so verse 2. So Jeremiah the prophet said to all people of Judah and all those living in Jerusalem, for 23 years from the um, year of uh, Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. That's what I told you. 23 long years, he was telling this message to people of God through different sermons, but they didn't hear. When you look at verse 4, 7, and 8, we can see that uh, the, uh, the, it is a deaf heart. They were deaf. The nation was deaf to hear God's word. They were not willing to hear what Jeremiah was telling. And in the end, we see in a very pathetic way, the shepherds, how to cry out and finished. As Jeremiah said, that will be the end for them. 
they didn't obey the voice of god through jeremia let's look at uh, uh, some of uh, these questions how do i understand and respect god's word in my life it's not very easy which is true and which is wrong but as we love the lord as we respect god's values and as we understand god's heartbeat then we can know what is god's word sometimes it may be a punishment but it's good for us and how we respect god's word secondly 23 long years he was consistent in his ministry involvement my dear brothers and sisters this is one word i am very much conscious of it consistency five years back i was active for the lord now gone something like that if it is so then we need to learn from jeremiah 23 long years he was faithful one more thought i just wanted to leave with you what are the factors you can note down for christians who are not responding to god's expectations now as you see in the church and as you see in our fellowship people are not faithful to god what are the factors if we can note down then we can be away from that and also we can help them to go back to god's word let's pray together father in heaven we thank you for this powerful passages in this five sermons of jeremiah we can get different perspectives about your heartbeat and we can get the real man jeremiah and he was bold he was very clear and even one time he himself was depressed lord we are thankful to you for ministering to us help us to take this message and pass it on to others who are in need to that time we commit ourselves to you continue to speak to us as we will continue our study from the book of jeremiah in the days to come in jesus precious name we pray amen